Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you this morning. I'll invite you to stand as uh, we prepare our hearts for worship. Let's, uh, let's bow our hearts this morning in prayer as we, uh, as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you so much for this time that we have today. Uh, we just ask that we can lay our burdens at the door um, and just be solely focused on you, and that this morning could be a time of focus, a time of renewal, um, and that I can just be such a blessing this morning as we uh, partake in this incredible gift that is worship alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ God. Um, so whatever your will may be, we just ask that it be done, and we ask that we can follow it boldly, but we follow it humbly as well, God. Um, it is in your beautiful, almighty name we pray. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Now I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 you 
Let's lift them up. Sing holy. Holy, holy, holy. Yes, he is. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. My Savior lives, my Savior lives, my Savior lives. Let's declare. Say, Jesus, you are the only way, my Savior, my Savior lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what he did. My Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way. Savior, my Savior, 
was a lot of fun. It was great, great news. Before we take a seat, I'll invite you to say good morning to your neighbor as we continue our service. Good morning, good morning. <clears throat> Well, good morning. It is good to be with you. Just want to encourage you, especially if you're new, there's a Connect card in the pew in front of you. You can also use your phone and just scan the uh, code there, and you can uh, just let us know who you are. Uh, also, after the service, if you want to go to the welcome desk, we have a gift for you. Those of you who are visiting with us, we're just really, really grateful that you are here. Just want to let you know that next week, immediately following this service, uh, I'm going to be in the room right off uh, to the side here, and uh, if you want to just meet with me, ask questions about what's going on here at Hope, our vision for Hope, our values here at Hope, would love to talk to you about that. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then also just want to let you know that uh, right now, going on in the gym, there are 23 second graders who are receiving uh, their Bible, receiving God's Word, and so we're just going to give them and God a big, big praise. And we are going to pray, pray that they would just have a passion and a love for God's Word and that Bible they want to open it up each day and just read through it along with their parents. also want to let you know about uh, the Veterans Day Luncheon. You just have another week to sign up for that. That's where we honor um, and uh, thank our veterans, not only within our church, but in our community. So if you know any veterans, please, please invite them because uh, they will be blessed. It's a huge blessing for me when I go, and I'm looking forward to it. So just want to encourage you. We need you to sign up, though, for that through sharethehope.org, register, um, or through the app, just so that we know that you are coming. And then also, we have a great ministry called Grief Share here at Hope uh, for people who have lost loved ones. And you know, um, if you've lost a loved one, how difficult the holidays can be. And so um, we have um, an opportunity to um, gather together, and um, uh, it's, called, it's called Surviving the Holidays, and how, when you're going through deep grief, um, how you can do that. So that's going to be um, taking place both at the Greece campus and also the Brockport campus on November 18th. We need you to register for that online or through the app, but it'll be a huge, huge blessing for you or if you know somebody who can be blessed by that. And then also, uh, November is just around the corner, so that means Thanksgiving is just around the corner, and we gather together. Many churches don't do this, unfortunately, anymore, but we gather together on Thanksgiving Eve, and we just take time to say thank you, Lord, for all the blessings. And that's going to be taking place at 630 um, on November 22nd. So just want to invite you to that uh, as well. So I'd like to just open with prayer before we get into God's Word. So would you bow your heads um, in prayer with me? Oh, Lord God, we want to see you. We want to see your face, your smile towards us. And we want to bask in your love that we might love others as you have called us to do that. So we just ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds what you have to say to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were a fly on the wall, you would see that this happens more often than not in homes where people are sitting around maybe the dinner table. And it could be either spouse, but let's just say it's the husband's. It could be the wife, but let's say it's the husband just staring at his cell phone. It used to be the newspaper, but now it's the news feed on the cell phone. And his wife is pouring out her heart about her day to him, and she gets frustrated, says, you're not listening to me. And he says, I'm listening. I can repeat every word that you said. And he can. Do you think that satisfies her? Do you think that makes her happy? No, because any recording device could just spit back the words, she said. What she wants, what she longs for, is for him to turn his face towards her, to look her in the eyes, to notice her, to pay attention, to understand. We're continuing in our series called Ing, Christianity 
is a verb. And today we're talking about noticing. And I don't think I ever preached in all my years on this topic of noticing. I never noticed that I never preached on this topic of noticing until we scheduled this series. And it's so important that we notice people, or what we might say more often is pay attention to people. Did you know that along with food and water, a baby needs the attentive gaze of a human face for survival? When parents look into the face of a baby, that baby begins to realize that they are sad, angry, happy. They see that in the face of another because the parent's face changes. Psychologists call this attunement, being attuned to your child. The baby realizes by the parent's face that they matter, that they are valued. But it doesn't just stop when we outgrow infancy, right? Even as adults, we want to be noticed. We want people to pay attention to us. Uh, there was a study done by Gerald Egan, um, and, and the way they did this, there was a prearranged signal in a class of students. I think it was a first-year college class. And this signal was given, and they were to do it gradually so nobody really noticed, but they were to go from being like uninterested in a slouched position, not paying any attention, to all of a sudden to kind of sit up in their seat, to look directly at the teacher, and to be engaged. And it was interesting, this experiment, the, the teacher, who was kind of teaching in monotone voice and, and looking at his notes, all of a sudden he started to become more animated and use more gestures, right? And he started to speak with more energy and faster, and then with a prearranged signal, gradually, so nobody recognized it. The students went back to uninterested, kind of a slouched position, and after a painful time of seeking reinforcement, and he didn't get it, the teacher kind of went back to his old ways. Fascinating experiment. Sometimes when I'm preaching, I wonder if you are secretly <laughs> doing that experiment. Because every speaker knows, and you want somebody to be engaged, right? Connected with you. It's so powerful. It's so encouraging. One of the great miracles of life is that our great God notices us. The psalmist says this, What is man that you are mindful, mindful of him? That's a rhetorical question. He knows that the God of the universe, the one who holds the universe in the palm of his hands, notices every single individual and everything about us, that he would pay attention to us. That's part of the reason why the scriptures talk about God's face and him turning his face towards us. God taught his people to hear this blessing when they would gather. It's called the ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you. Or some translation, the Lord look upon you with his countenance and give you peace. Beautiful words. To turn your face towards someone is to show them value. It's to pay attention to them. And when God came in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, man, did he notice people, especially people that nobody else noticed. He would turn his face toward them, and he would change their life. Many people uh, would be overlooked, not noticed, disregarded by other people, even the religious leaders, but not by Jesus. No one ever saw people like Jesus. Jesus noticed a tax collector in a tree. He noticed a widow that gave everything that nobody else noticed. He noticed when little children were being uh, excluded from him. He noticed a, a blind man that everybody else passed by. He noticed when his disciples were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. He noticed their fears and their doubts. Sometimes they probably wished he wouldn't notice quite so much. But the God of the Bible is the God who notices us. The psalmist says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Jesus talks about how he notices uh, every sparrow. You don't have to worry about your life. God takes care of the sparrows. He's going to take care of you. He sees when every sparrow falls to the ground, and he says, you are worth so much more. 
In fact, put all the sparrows in all the world on one side of the scale, put yourself on the other. It doesn't even compare because God loves you that much. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He notices if they fall out. He may not replace them, but he notices if they fall out. He notices sinful, raggedy, broken people like us. He notices the marginalized and the lonely and the lost. And the more that we live in the love of God, that his face is turned towards us, and there is a smile, not a frown, the more we live in his countenance and his love, the more we will love other people like he does. So how are you at noticing people these days? I don't know about you, but I need to grow in this area a whole lot. So I thought we would do a little experiment today, okay? So we're going to show you a video. I just want you to pay attention to the directions in the video, you know, and count like they say. So if we could just show this video. He passes, does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So how many of you saw the moonwalking bear? Did you, did you notice? Yeah, some of you did. You may have seen that before. Or maybe you noticed it the first time. It's hard to see something that you're not looking for, right? The more we are connected to Jesus, the more we follow Jesus, we are going to have the eyes of Jesus. But if we never ask Jesus to to change our hearts, to change our eyes. We will just let the busyness of life lead us to intentional blindness. And we don't notice the people that God places right in our lives for a reason. Doug Pollock in his book says, the inwardly focused life, a selfish, nearsighted kind of life, he calls it myopia, <laughs> where we are just focused on me, myself, and I. And he says, the best way to cure this disease, which clouds our spiritual vision, is to start each day with a simple prayer. God, help me to see others like you see them. And I just wonder if this is what the disciples of prayer kind of like that. Let Lord just help me. Uh, to church one day. Um, before we get into Acts chapter 3, we're going to hang out there for a little bit. Let me, just, let me just ask you this. You know, sometimes people will say to me, Kirk, you know, I've been a believer a long, long time, and I don't really have a whole lot of unbelievers uh, in my life. And, and that, unfortunately, can be true. The longer we know Christ, the, the less we know unbelieving people. And I just say, do you realize when you come here on Sunday morning, there always, thank God, are people who are searching, people who are exploring, people who are looking for community. Do you notice people on Sunday morning? Or do you like just come here just you know, simply, I'm just going to receive for myself? Or do you realize that, that God actually might have a purpose for you on Sunday morning to notice some people? Maybe, maybe not just always talk to the same people, but maybe reach out to somebody that you don't know. That's where the adventure of Christianity begins, friends, when you say, God, I just want you to use me today. That's what I believe happened with Peter and John in Acts chapter 3. We're going to camp here for a little while. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter... He asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. 
So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. I want to look at this verse 4 once again. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And Peter said, look at us. So Peter and John, they're walking to the temple, and they look straight at this guy, and they noticed him. Okay. You can't meet a need until you notice the need. I think of how different Acts chapter 3 would be if they did not notice this guy. Peter and John went to church, they prayed, and then they went home. There would have been no miracle if they did not notice this need. And so when I read through this text, the first question I ask myself is, how many needs do I walk by that I should have noticed but have not? Now, we're not called to meet every need. Only God can do that. We're called, though, to follow God and to listen to his voice and follow his promptings and be obedient to them, whatever they might be. But how many people does God want you to notice in your school, or your workplace, or in your family, and you're just scrolling through the feed, right? And we just don't notice because we're so preoccupied with stuff. Peter turned his face toward this man. He looked at him. What is the atmosphere like in your homes these days? Do you know what's going on in your kids' or your grandkids' life? What's going on in their hearts? Are you noticing? How about the people that you walk by in your workplace every day? Are you noticing them? They are living souls, and they're going to live somewhere forever. And God put them into our lives for a reason, across our path for a reason, to invest in them, to turn our face toward them, maybe just for a moment, maybe longer. This is a story from the website Doable Evangelism. Uh, it gives examples of people just loving people um, in Jesus' name, noticing them, just in their everyday routines. I work at a local community college and often buy lunch in the cafeteria. When I first encountered the lunch lady, she was taking my money. I noticed that she had short gray hair and the kind of fingernail polish that changes according to the holiday. I also noticed that her name tag said Dottie. The next week, I told her I liked her nails, and I noticed that she had a bad chest cold. I prayed for her health, but I didn't mention my prayer to her. The following week, I asked her how her cold was. She said it wasn't getting better, and she was worried because she is a breast cancer survivor. She was afraid that the cancer might have come back. It was two more weeks before I saw Miss Dottie again. When I asked how she was, she said that the doctors had told her the cancer was back. We teared up together, and I promised to pray for her. The next week, I brought Miss Dottie a present. It was a book called Thanks for the Mammogram. It's a book on facing cancer with faith, hope, and humor. I also gave her a card thanking her for always being there to smile at me, and I offered to go to treatment with her sometime. She grabbed my hand and said, thank you so much. Then she asked me to come around to the other side of the booth to give her a hug. Later, Miss Dottie had to quit her job due to her cancer. Our faith community hosted a We Love Miss Dottie fundraiser and raised over $1,000 for her family. She was astonished that strangers would care for her in this way. I'm grateful to God that I noticed Miss Dottie. God has planted her firmly in my heart, and I can't stop praying for her. You never know how God is going to use you when you stop to notice someone. So just a few things that I want us to glean from this passage in Acts chapter 3. First of all, do you realize that God is going to often use us just in the midst of our everyday routines? It's not like we have to do something big in order for this, and just in our everyday routines. It's interesting, when you look at Acts chapter 3, what ended up as supernatural just started as supernormal, just a normal day. Going to See, in that culture, they would go to the temple every day, pray three times a day. That's what they did. It's just their normal routine. 
And it's in your normal routines, whether it's school, work, or your activities, that, that God can use you. Peter and John, uh, they were going to church. They were taking time to pray. We know they also would open up their Bible and read that together, right? God's Word. And it's interesting they put these habits into their lives because healthy habits open you to holy moments of worship and prayer and being in Scripture. Do you realize how much of Jesus' life with his disciples a lot of it was just daily grind, right? We got to walk from this town to that town. We got to get dinner this week or this night, and we got to make sure we go to the synagogue uh, this this Sabbath. And they just they just did these routines. But within the midst of that, they had these practices of prayer, of worship, hearing God's word. So often we want God to mail us a miracle, but we're not willing to pray three times a day. So oftentimes people will say to me, oh, Kirk, when I came uh, and, and I heard the song or heard the message, it was just like God was speaking right to my heart. And I'm like, that is, that is so, so cool. But you know, realize that sometimes, friends, we come and maybe it doesn't feel like that. Maybe God had a message for the person who's sitting right next to you. It doesn't mean you're not going to get something out of it. But because you put in the habit of being here, on a regular basis, you don't miss those holy moments when they come. When you read scripture, right? It's not like the heavens open up and the angels sing every time you open up the Bible. That doesn't happen. But you just will miss the holy moments if you do not have that healthy habit of doing that. This is what was going on, Peter and John. One day, they're going to church. And they noticed this guy. Why? Well, part of it is because this guy asked them for money. He had a need that he thought they could take care of. But why did Peter really notice? Why did he think this day he needed to tell him something even greater that this guy needed? Something even more than money. I believe it was simply because they were listening to the Holy Spirit prompting them, that they just felt moved to go and talk to this guy on this particular day. It's so important as we are trying to be used by God in people's lives is, and, and to witness to them is to, is to make sure that we are being led by God. God, would you use me? God, would you help me? Help me to hear what you want me to do. Peter went to the temple every day to pray. This guy was there every day, but on this particular day, he went up to him and looked directly at him. And why this time? I don't know for sure. Okay, again, I can only guess that he was simply was moved by the Spirit to do this. What would happen if maybe we started our day kind of like this or at some point early in our day? And I know you're all really, really busy, so you can't add a, t a whole lot more to your life. But what if we just said, God, today my life is in your hands. Would you use me to point you uh, to someone in my life? If you want me to say something to them, I'll say it. If you want me to just be quiet and serve them and love them and be a friend of them, I will do that as well. But I just want you to lead me today by your spirit. Would that take 20, 30 seconds to pray that? That's again where the adventure of Christianity. And sometimes throughout your day, the spirit will prompt you to, yeah, to speak to somebody and maybe ask them a wondering question. Like, I just wonder, what, what's your faith story? I wonder, do, if, do you go to church? Maybe invite them to church. Sometimes the Spirit will just prompt you to just simply listen, to just serve, to love, to just be a friend to them. But either way, either way, you are listening to the Holy Spirit throughout your life, and you can put your head on your pillow at night knowing you have cooperated with the Spirit, which is what we want, which is what Peter and John were doing. They noticed this guy. And this day, this time, they were led to speak. They said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. At some point in our relationships with others, friends, family, court, we need to somehow let them know that they have a greater need that they're not even aware of. This paralyzed man, what he actually needed, he wasn't even aware of anymore. Because he had lived with this condition for so long, the man didn't notice, you know, that he, he needed to walk. He probably wasn't even thinking about, oh, on this day, I might walk. No, he's been this way for birth, so what, maybe 30, 40 years? He wasn't even thinking that way. That ship had sailed a long time ago. It wasn't even on his radar. There are people in your world 
who, because they're beaten down by the world, they're just so discouraged, they're not dreaming anymore. Or, or there's people in your world right now who they're looking great on the outside. They've, they've got the good marriage, they've got the good house and car and, and the kids and the great 401k, the great job. Everything is going good except, except at nighttime when he's really, really restless and doesn't understand why or why the fun fix doesn't keep the joy and, and why there's something just seems like there's missing in his life. They don't even know that they have a greater need, that they're not even, they're not even aware of it. This guy looks at the two apostles walking by, and he wants a little change for his tin cup that he can rub them together. Nothing wrong, by the way, with blessing the poor. A few chapters later, Peter and John set up a whole ministry, okay, to bless the poor. But on this particular day, uh, they they spoke to him. What if, what if Peter and John just gave him some change and walked away? He would have had some change, right? But not lasting change. He would have spent that change, right? It would have been gone. But Peter wanted to give him lasting change. He wanted to give him change of mobility, change of heart, change of eternity. God didn't just want to give him a little bit of money, a little bit of change. God wanted to change his whole life. He didn't want to give him just a, a little money. He wanted to give him the miracle of mobility and change his life forever. And the reason why we notice people and love people and pay attention to them and serve them is because in the hopes that we might be able to point them to what they need the most, grace and love and forgiveness and salvation and everlasting life through Jesus Christ alone. If you read on in Acts chapter 3, this man, after he is healed, he's leaping, he's praising God, certainly because he can walk now, but also because of the salvation he had in Jesus. Peter talks about it later in his sermon in Acts 23, about through Jesus Christ, there is eternal life. And then Peter goes on to tell the crowd about why this miracle happened. Peter actually tells what the miracle was really, really for. I mean, you realize, right, that all the miracles of Jesus and the apostles, they're a sign. They're always pointing to something even better than the miracle. This man is walking. He's jumping. What could be better than that? Every Jew that was going to the temple probably remembered the words of Isaiah at that moment. Isaiah chapter 35. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Isaiah the prophet there, he's talking about when the Messiah would come, he is going to restore and change everything. He's going to make all things new when there's no more sin or disease or death. And Peter talks about this in verse 21. He says, heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for God, what? To restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. He's going to restore all things. Have you ever asked yourself, why did Jesus and the apostles do the miracles that they did? It wasn't just about, hey, let me show you some naked power that I have. It wasn't about, hey, you, you need to know I have the truth and you don't, or I have the power and you don't. That's not why they did miracles. If they wanted to do miracles for that reason, they could have said like, hey, look, I can look right through these walls and see what's on the other side. Or they would have done a miracle like, hey, watch me levitate. Watch me float in the air. They didn't do that. Every miracle that Jesus or the apostles did was to alleviate suffering or trouble. Why? Because all miracles point forward to the end of all history. To remind us God didn't invent blindness or lameness or cause suffering and death. Mankind did that. When God put human beings in the garden, they were perfect and they were supposed to serve and love God. But when we turned away from God, everything fell apart. It's at that point that poverty and injustice and suffering and sickness and disease and death exploded into this planet. With every miracle that they do, it shows that God is no happier with human suffering than you are. He's not. Biblical miracles um, are showing us that one day he's going to fix all things the way that he intended them to be. Sometimes when people are talking with me about miracles, they say, well, miracles, a good definition is miracles are the suspension of the natural order. Yeah. Better definition is 
Miracles are the restoration of the natural order. They actually show what it's supposed to be like, the way God wanted it to be. Jesus and the apostles' healings are the only natural things in an unnatural world, broken by sin and wickedness and evil and demons. And one day God is going to end all suffering. And if we are a church on his side, then we will be enemies of suffering just like God has, and we will do everything we can to alleviate it whenever we can. We will notice when people are in pain and suffering and loneliness and hopelessness and aimlessness and will serve and love and point people to the only one who can restore and save them. And why is Jesus the only one who can save and restore? Why is God's face always turned towards you? And as a smile instead of a frown, it's because when Jesus walked on this earth, he went to a cross where he took all of your sin and my sin into himself. He who knew no sin became sin. He who only looked in love on the Father's gaze from all eternity and only received the Father's gaze of love for all eternity. There on the cross, the Father turned away his face. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you turned your face from me? And Jesus died for us in our place. And they buried him, but he rose again, and he conquered sin and the grave. And because of what he did, now God will turn his face towards you, and he will never leave you or forsake you. He will turn his face towards you, and he will bless you and keep you and give you his peace. And the more you know that, and the more you see his face, so in, in Christ Jesus, the more you're going to want to walk and leap and praise him with your life. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Oh, Lord God, we just pray right now for people who are listening to this Brockport campus online here at the Greece campus. If they have never realized until today their greatest need is a Savior, that they would just receive Jesus right now as their forgiver, as their leader of their life. And Lord God, for us, we just ask that you would help us to have the eyes of Jesus, to see what you want us to see, to see the people you want us to see, and just lead us and guide us. Well, Lord God, we just pray, we just take a moment right now to pray for the needs of your church, Thank you for the blessings of your church. We pray that we would be a light, a city on a hill that people would see, that they would be drawn to you. We pray, Lord God, for all of our servants, all of those who give of their gifts, that you would just bless, that you would remind them that they are a part of your eternal purposes and your mission. Lord God, when each of us leaves here, remind us that we are to be your salt and light to a world that desperately needs to know of your love and your grace. Would you bless, would you anoint, would you do a work in our hearts? We avail ourselves to you. We just give ourselves to you. Ask that you would use us, Lord. Help us to cooperate with you. And we just look forward to how you're going to use us. We'll give you all glory, honor, and praise. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our great God together. Yeah. 
Dear Heavenly Father, you are with us all the time. Even when we can't see it, you have plans for us. God, help us trust you. Help us trust the truth that is your love, that is your sacrifice, that is your mercy for us, Jesus. Yeah, we do not deserve us. You give us a life of happiness. You give us an eternity of peace. And God, we are grateful for that. We worship you for that. It is in your great name that we praise and we sing and we lift you up and we live our lives for. It's in your great almighty name that we pray. displayed on a criminal's cross and darkness rejoiced and no heaven had lost but then Jesus rose with our freedom and that's when death was arrested
Thing to do this morning. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.